Hello and welcome to another episode of D-Web Decoded. I am your host for this week, Porter Stoll from the Filecoin Foundation. Today we have a very special guest, a new member to the ecosystem that I can't wait to meet and learn more about. Craig Patty, welcome to the show. Thank you, Porter. Appreciate you. Just a quick note. I mean, everybody says it, but my last name is actually pronounced Patty, but all right. Nine out of ten people say Patty. Uh, I stand and, uh, Just so, because you know, we're going to be speaking again, and you may introduce me to somebody else, and I would love for you to say it like that. My grandfather used to say, Patty, like lady. <laughs> I like that. That's catchy. <laughs> Where in the world are you calling in from today? I am in Toronto, Canada. Very nice. Uh, well, I'm here from Park City, Utah. And you are one of the newest entrants to the Filecoin ecosystem. I don't think a lot of people know who you are. So what's your origin <laughs> story? How did we get to this spot in our history? Uh, do you mean how did I get it to associated with Filecoin and DStore yeah. and all that stuff? Yeah, cool. Uh, for sure. So um, I've been in sales since I was about uh, 14. And throughout that journey along the way, I worked at a data center called Pier One, and it's been bought out and changed names a million times since then. But at that data center, uh, and that data center, by the way, was sort of my introduction to IT. I was I founded a recording studio uh, with three other guys uh, that was in business for 18 years. And when you have your own business and you're a startup like a recording studio, you don't have money for IT guys. You don't have money to call some guy to come and fix your stuff. And so we had to learn how to fix everything in our own studio and build the studio and all that stuff. And that's where I sort of got uh, quite a good background, mostly in Mac OS, but just in the way computers work and fixing them and picking out hard drives and doing all that stuff. And so that's what got me the job at the data center somehow and my sales prowess, of course. And then uh, at the data center, I met Jen, Jennifer Bell at the time. And Jen and I were working together, we sat beside each other. And Jen was the uh, director of marketing or the CMO, she, director of marketing at the time. And uh, I was an account manager. And uh, we became fast friends. And uh, then Jen left and went on to other jobs. And then so did I. But we've stayed in touch all along the way, and we've uh, and we've been able to ha to keep a, a great relationship going ever since then. That's like ten years ago, probably. Um, and uh, when I started painting, as you can see the paintings in the background, she she was one of the first people to buy one of my paintings. She absolutely loved it. She said, "Oh my god, I can't stop thinking about it. I want to buy this one." I was like, "Oh my god." So, uh, and then Jen went to Protocol Labs, and uh, very soon after she started there, she called me and said, listen, I'm working at this place. You would love this place because she's always, and I've always been kind of a visionary. I see applications very quickly and where their, app, where their, app, their applications and their use cases are. Like I, I see something or I grab a, something and I go, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. And she knows that. And she's like, you're going to love this. I'm going to get you over here. And I uh, interviewed uh, I had four interviews or five interviews, in fact, with Protocol Labs. And it, everything was down the wire. Like she was just getting an offer letter ready. Uh, and there was a hiring freeze at that very moment. And uh, so that didn't happen. And that was exactly last year in uh, July 2023. But what happened was when she told me about Protocol Labs and what they did, and I said, and she says, decentralized storage. And I said, what the heck is that? And I had been working at a software company called Back to the Systems, which is a backup storage software. So I, I come from a storage background, and I had no idea what she was talking about. And I was absolutely uh, uh, curious is too mild a word. I was like, what the is this? What are you talking about? What do you mean decentralized? So. I did a deep dive. She actually called me in April and by July we found out I wasn't going to be working there. But from April to July, I did such a deep dive into, you know, YouTube and online and all these things. What is decentralized? Like, how do I wrap my head around? I wasn't getting it either. And I was like, oh my God, I, I'm not understanding. Like I got to really 
it's it's complicated when you first don't know about blockchain and I and like everyone else, I thought blockchain was just crypto and boy was I wrong. And you know, there wasn't much on YouTube at the time or help help me understand how this all worked and how it worked in storage and why it was safer and all this stuff. And I was completely uh, 100, once I started to actually piece it all together for these interviews and, you know, know enough to talk about interviews, I was like, this is the future. And the reason why I loved it so much and I was so uh, passionate about it, and I clearly we all are and I still am, is because it really is uh, the better the, the next iteration of the internet is, and it's way, way better because of, and I, I, you and I spoke about this before, but, you know, I've always believed that the way the internet foundation has been built, I, I don't believe that everybody understands this, is built to manipulate five, six, every person on the planet. It's built to manipulate us, to sell more stuff to us, to, to do, to, to, to spend more time online and doing all this stuff and it's and and it's wrong it's so wrong and when i discovered decentralized system not just the storage but everything i was like okay this eliminates all that bullshit and it, it gives the power back to us and we own our own data like not owning your own data is pe people don't even understand that they don't own their own data so let's I, let's, dive, let's dive into that because like i love this story where, you know, part of what I'm trying to do, what I think your your uh, charter will be, is to prevent people having to go down the same rabbit holes that we did. So if, yeah, you, were talk, right. if you were to talk to someone who is curious about the space, like how do you distill all that information into its most simplistic form that's frankly consumable? That's a great question. And, uh, and I practice this almost every day because I had to explain it to my girlfriend. I had to explain it to my mom, to my son. My mom's a grandma. I got to explain it to a grandma. You just got to somehow explain it in a way that everyone can understand. And, um, one of the way, like explaining decentralized storage became fairly easy to me because Central is one place where everything is, and decentralized means that you can have one file in lots of different places without getting into the technical sharding and all that stuff. Just that, just the basics, right? right? Everything is here, or everything is in multiple locations. If something happens wow. here, but you could it's all be gone. distributed. You could be distributed, <laughs> but in an effort to just get them to understand. I can get sure. granular after just a high level. Everything is here and everything is all over. Like you're one, I told my mom, one picture, you send me a picture of yourself and it goes to a decentralized system. That picture can be replicated on, uh, to 10 machines easily. And when you ever, you need it, if you need to get it back, you can get it back. If it's over here and something happens over here, your picture could be gone. So, that was sort of the, the basic um, explanation. But when it comes to like a lot of questions that I get are why is it safer? And why is it more secure? And why is it more sort of uh, immune to ransomware hacks and hackers in general? And the, the, the easiest explanation that I have is that, uh, you know, in the decentralized storage, the file is can be split up into fragments or sharded and it goes into like many different nodes, it could be hundreds. And a hacker is not going to, a hacker is just a human being with a job to do, really. If you wanna take away the, the business that they're doing, they're actually, if you just look at it as a job, my job is to go and hack this machine. They're not gonna hack one node that's gonna take them a long time to get a small as only a piece of information and that that will do nothing for them they won't even be able to sell it on the dark web whereas if they hack amazon and they hack a they get the key to the whole data infrastructure in there and they can go and take all that information and go and sell it on the dark web that is much more appealing to them 
and trying to attack little nodes one by one. And that's like, I don't know if that helps. Do you think that's a simple enough? I, I, I'm trying to simplify it as much as I can. Well, that's the thing that like, there's lots of answers to this question. There's no one right answer to this question, but I always challenge people to come up with a, this dialogue and to sit uncomfortably as I have myself trying to right. out the different narratives because ultimately it may change what example or story you tell may change based on your audience. One of the ones I like, I like poaching from Bitcoin uh, because, you know, you can just parlay those successes from, you know, digital currency or digital property into digital decentralized storage. For example, when you give like one of the Bitcoin ones that I love is when you give your money to a bank, that's no longer your money. The bank is giving you an IOU on that money. And right. I don't think that's very different than public, you know, the public cloud providers where you give your data to the public cloud uh, is no longer your data. They're just giving you access to your data. Uh, and that means the hype, the public cloud provider could deplatform you. They have control. Mm -hmm. uh, they have security risks. Uh, as you mentioned, there's all these different things, but I think it's a good mental model on why, like how do you begin to understand uh, what decentralized storage is? I feel like when I explain decentralized storage to people, I'm like in the game show Wipeout, where you have to go through all these crazy <laughs> obstacles, and you know, all of a sudden you're going to be walking across the wall, and like the the little gloves going to come out and punch you in the face. So, and I think about that it's like if I go anywhere too complicated or at the wrong time, I'm just going to lose my audience. So, you know, I, you know, someone who's like gone down the rabbit hole and now has made this their career like and your goal is sales uh that is what your your, your charter is within this when this ecosystem or how you've chosen to play in it like that that gives you a very unique vantage point because of all the sales experience you've had throughout your career and then all of a sudden you have this this new gadget to sell uh to your to your target user. And it's just a fascinating way to learn how your brain approaches that problem. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And the other, the other thing that is a big uh, uh, challenge is, is um, the awareness of not owning your data. Like the fact that people just aren't even aware, uh, you know, that when they give their data to any centralized system, Data is now uh, essentially open to the, to the behind the scenes people to go and extract all the information they want out of that data. It's not private. It's not, your data is not private. It belongs, it, it no longer belongs to you. You know, to go back to what you said, you're almost, <laughs> in a weird way, you're renting your data. You're paying to rent your data to these people who are, making money off you're paying them to make money off you it doesn't even make any sense it's so it's so wrong and in de in a decentralized system you own your data no one can go in and extract and analyze your data and sell it to advertisers that then infiltrate your in mailbox that you have to spend how many hours a year deleting like why why do I even get mail in my my email should be private like I shouldn't be getting ads but it's because of this uh, ownership and that this is one thing that I'm noticing is really misunderstood that people just aren't aware. So like you know you touch on themes that apply to a B two C audience or consumer products, uh, but you're also highlighting concerns within an enterprise space. Do you like draw? Or do you look at them differently, or do you both suffer from the the same problems out there? Yeah, that's and uh, they both they both suffer from the same problems. But um, the que the challenges that I receive, like we mostly are, we're dealing with business to business in our space, or business for business, as we like to call it, and the. The challenges I have 
will be different from depending on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to a researcher or a librarian, verifiability is extremely important to them. If I'm, and then security comes in afterwards. But if I'm talking to a CTO or a CIO, security is the number one issue. So it depends on who I'm talking to. But to your point, uh, even some of those people are maybe not so aware that they're not owning their data. They're certainly aware that their data can be breached, and they're certainly aware that something could happen to their data at Amazon or Google or whoever. But there seems to be a mis a disconnection between the fact that they don't own it. I I don't know how to bring that away. A big challenge for me is to how do I make them aware of it? Well, and is it painting the other side of that coin? So, okay, if I'm, if I, you and I are having a conversation, I'm kind of like your classic target audience person. I could, I could nod my head and hear you say, I don't own my data. But what does that mean for me? What, or maybe what, is, what am I missing out on because I don't own my data? So there's a, there's a list. So no one has access to your information. So they can't, you're not being profited. You, nobody's taking advantage of your, of you and your information. And now that's, a, it's not, I can't make you, I, my, my job is to make you feel that. And I know what I just said doesn't make you feel that, but that is my challenge is to how to make you feel like you're not being profited from, you're not being taken advantage of. Uh, B, you're not, you're, you have way less chances of being hacked. Now, as a consumer, most of us with Google Drive or OneDrive or whatever, we're not really seeing those problems. We're not really, we always have access. We should just pretty much always have access. But in enterprise, they are seeing it every day. Ransomware attacks, losing all kinds of files, health records, everything, all this critical information is going away in petabytes all the time. And that is, for, that is something they are very aware of. And if I can say, look, I'm not saying that this is impenetrable, but you're, the odds of getting hacked here are way less than where you are now. And that is very attractive to them. And then they want me to show them how and prove it. But that is, you know, the biggest thing for the CTOs and CIOs. But uh, there's the security, there's the ownership of your data of not getting taken advantage of. And also, uh, yeah, I guess not losing your data because if you're in Amazon and whatever drive goes down that they have you in, you have to pay for, you have to pay for second and third copies. And then you have to pay extra for geographical location additions. So, I mean, it becomes very expensive. It's like 20, it could be over $25,000 a month for a petabyte with Amazon, which is an insane amount of money. You know, so uh, the, the comment on all the hyperscalers are the walled gardens. Very easy to get in, very hard to move around or, or get out. Based on your description so far, how does like, and like, how do you get to that $25,000 per month bill? Like, how does that walled garden manifest itself with the situation you just described? In Amazon or whatever, the, one of the hyperscalers? Yeah, it's, pick your hyperscaler. Yeah, so they uh, you start with the base fee, which have, which was they'll charge you X per tib per terabyte, and then after that, um, after that, the, if you want a second copy and or a third copy, they'll charge you an extra fee for that, and then if you want a different location, they'll charge you another fee for that. So now you're starting to go up from whatever it is they start at uh, 10 bucks a tip or eight bucks a tip or something. And then after that, and that's the easy part and that's the cheap part actually, because that's, that's not actually costing you that much money. Like you said, it's easy to get in, but now that you want to, if you want to go get that data, the egress fees, the cost to take that data out are usually three times the amount that you've paid up front usually three times. So if you're paying 15 bucks a tip now for what you've got, multiply that by three, $45 a terabyte for your, to get your data back. 
uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, um, in most, in all the storage providers and decentralized storage, everyone has different pricing fee structures, but I haven't come across any that have any egress fees. What you get, it's, we'll charge X amount per tip and sure there's going to be some, if you need extra things, you can add on, but if you want it, that's right there for you. Yeah. I, I got one more big question that we can spend some time on before I get you out of here on a Friday afternoon, Craig, but you know, I, I always try to ask myself, how does Filecoin win and win big? So I have a goal for uh, web two adoption, which is 10, 10% uh, market share for Filecoin within three years. And that, that's, a mo- that's a monster amount of data, uh, well north of uh, where we are today. I think Filecoin is already positioned to do very well within the Web3 space. But, you know, you're trying to outline to get people on board with a philosophy where whether your storage providers, software vendors or clients themselves run to us or run to the network to solve their problems. I think you've touched on a number of problems. Uh, For me, like what I see Filecoin winning is mobility, uh, protection, which, you know, there's a lot under these words. Um, but the final component is also monetization. But, you know, these are the, the paradigms, I think, that are out there where you put all three together. And Filecoin tells a very compelling story. But, you know, I want to hear from you and your experience. How does Filecoin win big? You know, we are at the moment, I'm sure there will be more, but right now, uh, D-Store is the, is the, essentially, we are the sales operation for decentralized storage for Filecoin at the moment. And our job is to bring in leads and our job is to uh, get people, get more people on the network and, and get all these storage providers going, right? And so uh, that's my, I'm on a mission. And I'm on a mission because I know it's the better way. And I'm still trying to, I'm I'm still trying to be impeccable with my words so that I convince, uh, especially Web2 adoption. Like that's my, I'm really, and and, and stop me if I start going off track, but this is connected. Um, I'm starting to see now, and I'm really just starting to see, to be honest, this week, where Web2 backup and storage software companies are starting to partner with Web3 storage companies. And that just happened like this. It hasn't, it doesn't yet. And what that tells me is this is the beginning of the bridge between Web2 and Web3. And that is fantastic news for us because it's been slow to adopt and that's okay because to be honest, we didn't even have user interfaces, right? It's been a skeleton. It's been like the internet was with email and moving into web two. It's like we, now we're getting user interfaces, storage providers are starting to have, you know, nice landing pages and, but we didn't have that. So only technical people could really get in. Now the storage providers are providing a nice pane of glass, an easy way to drag and drop your files. You don't need to code to store your files here. You don't need to hire somebody. You don't need to be handheld. We're, they're making it easier. And that's just happening all in the last month. And, and it's going to happen a lot more. And so we're at the very bottom of this curve where people are going to start realizing it's safer. It's easier to use. I can have a hot copy and I can have archives. And it's all right there. You can't even have hot copies with Amazon and hyperscalers. So there's a lot of advantages. There's so many advantages to doing it, but it's just getting that message out there to these Web2 companies that has been really challenging. But it's also been challenging because we haven't had the infrastructure to make it easy for them. Like, I want to say, I'm going to give you three steps. You can, it's so easy. Step one, you book a meeting with me. Step two, I give you a demo. Step three, you start migrating your information. Bam. That's, but that has not been possible until April. So we are going to see a massive influx of people coming in because I'm 
find them. <laughs> well, I, uh, I love that vision and positivity. Where can people find you uh, out there on the interwebs, Craig? Um, before we go to my, to, to my contacts, I have a question for you because this is the last week only, but it's blowing my mind and I'd love to, to know what you have heard or what you know about this. Sure. Quantum computing in the blockchain. It's a topic that's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there something specific? Well, yes. I mean, not just with crypto. I mean, although it's, it's said that Q Day, which is Qubit Day, which means that the day that a quantum computer will be able to crack the code, to, to crack the encryption in blockchain, is going to be the day where every cybersecurity company is going to start selling quantum proofing your systems. And they're saying it's going to be next year. Are you, as any, are any storage providers thinking about quantum computing proofing their systems yet? So before, uh, you know, two careers ago, I was at IBM. Obviously IBM was on the forefront of quantum computing. They were talking about this in 2017. And it was next year. Uh, <laughs> I remember in 2018, everyone told me that uh, driver, fully autonomous vehicles were going to be the reality and mainstream products in 2020, 2021, 2024. I think, I think across the board, tech was absolutely, this is 100% going to be re reality when you're talking six years ago. And I feel like I hear the same things with quantum and there's always this risk that people assign with quantum and blockchain. Uh, and it's been out there forever. Uh, and what are you supposed to say to that question? Yes, <laughs> yes maybe. Um, until, and like, until you get like someone in quantum who knows what they're talking about, go in and do a 15-minute demo on how you can quickly go crack a blockchain like a nut. There, there's really nothing to discuss. I, I have no doubt in the future of technology will blow our minds in many ways, shape or form. And quantum will be a massive player at some point in our evolution. But what it looks like, I, I just don't know. And, you know, you deal with it when it comes. Craig, I, I, I'm so excited for the world to get more view of you and all your work. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, how can people connect with you? Yeah, thanks for having me today, Porter. It was fun uh, chatting with you and and trying and going over all this stuff. I'm still looking for the right way to help people understand how great this this new technology is. Um, I, I'm at dstore.com. It's it's super easy. D e s t o r dot com, and uh, my email is Craig at dstore.com. LinkedIn, Twitter, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, Telegram. Uh, that's about it, I think. All right. Well, uh, for those of you just meeting Craig for the first time, be on the lookout. Uh, a new face to Filecoin. Good to have you, Craig. Thanks so much, Porter. Talk soon. Cheers.